The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in trusting Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world Falls around me I rest And know That He has found me Christ the rock Is my foundation Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, we will be discussing the core definitions aspects, expectations, and destiny of the church as is revealed by God's Word, the Bible. As with so many other things, and is so often the case, there is frequently confusion about the nature and function of the church. It is my hope that this episode will serve to eliminate some of the confusion and to refocus our understanding to a correct biblical foundation and framework for Christ's church. Father, I pray that by your Spirit you would prepare our hearts to hear and receive your call and to be separated by your grace from death unto life. I pray that you would help us to comprehend the mystery that is your body of believers called the Church. We give all thanks, praise, and honor to you, Lord Jesus, in whom we find redemption, justification, sanctification, and eternal life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now as we look at the history of the church, it is perhaps helpful to remember the basic fact that the church was made necessary by the fall in the Garden of Eden. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 reveals that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, was slain from the foundation of the earth. Since God's foreknowledge anticipated the fall and the need for redemption by Jesus' sacrifice, we must also conclude that the church was also anticipated from before the foundation of creation. The fact of the matter is that the church goes far beyond mere anticipation. The church in its various aspects was and is a carefully planned, groomed, and nurtured entity according to God's perfect will. There are four questions we hope to answer as a result of this episode. The questions are, one, what is the biblical definition of the word church? Two, how does God define his own church? 3. What are the biblical responsibilities of the church? And finally, 4. What is the eternal destiny of the church? As we enumerate the questions that as a goal we intend to answer, you will note that we immediately have a potential conflict of starting points, of definitions, and of outcome. 
Well, it seems self-evident that we who are Christians, that the logical correct starting point to defining and understanding concepts of God's church should rightly start from God and His Word, the Bible. Instead, we already know that man has instead historically, in one way or another, redefined one or more aspects of the church to suit his own purpose. As a result, at the outset, we need to be very careful to remember what the questions are not. Number one, it's not, what is man's definition of the word church? Instead, it's, what is the biblical definition of the word church? Two, it's not, how does man define his own church? Instead, it's, how does God define his own church? Three, it's not, how does the church make itself palatable to the secular world? Instead, it's, what are the biblical responsibilities of the church? And finally, four, it's not how effective is the worldly business model or success of the church. Instead, it's what is the eternal destiny of the church. Let's begin with question number one. What is the biblical definition of the word church? In order to answer the correct question, what is the biblical definition of the word church, we turn to the passage of first mention of the church to get clarification. In this case, the passage of first mention is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. Quote, when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it." Unquote. References to the same account are also found in part in both Mark chapter 8 verse 29 and Luke chapter 9 verse 20. Now, as a general rule in studying God's Word, the passage of first mention is almost always significant in many ways. In this case, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18, do not disappoint us. So as we begin our study in earnest, what does God's Word reveal? Firstly, we have the first use of the word church in the Greek from which we obtain our definition. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. The word ekklesia is comprised of two smaller Greek words. The first is ek, which means out of, from, or away from. The second is kaleo, which means to call aloud, to utter, or to call in a loud voice, or to invite. Therefore, the Greek word as a joint, ekklesia, means called ones, or those called out. This definition alone immediately begs additional questions which will shed light regarding the nature of the church. The questions are as follows. A. Called by whom? B. Called out from what? C. Called out to do what? Let's answer the questions one at a time. The first question, A, is called by whom? Once again, the answer seems obvious, but we should not make any assumptions. If the church belongs to God, then it is ultimately God, and not any man who is doing the calling of those who comprise his church. The above verse from Matthew is the first to remind us that it is Jesus, and not man, who is building Christ's church. Romans chapter 8, verses 29-30 through 30 give additional support. Quote, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified." Unquote. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 reminds and confirms our initial contention that the church was anticipated from the foundation of the world and of creation. As the above verse discusses the church, it is easy to get sidetracked by the words foreknew and predestined and to attribute those terms to the belief that certain individuals are chosen to a destiny which they themselves are somehow unable to escape or have no control. 
But I believe the correct perspective is to understand that God lives outside time in eternity. As a result, God has the advantage of knowing the end result and destiny of all things. In this scenario, God's will is to bring as many as possible into conformity to the free gift of his love, grace, and peace with himself. At the same time, God is not forcing anyone to do what they are not, what they are not willing to do. Consequently, all people are free to make whatever decisions to do whatever they choose to do. Ultimately, whatever decisions people make, God is prepared for since he is not limited to the present but has, is already at the conclusion. In the event people would choose to rebel against his call and his offer, God is not surprised since he is at the end. In the event people respond to his call to repentance, they do so by his grace through faith, but again, God is not surprised. The remainder of the verse simply says that once the process of response to God's call has begun in earnest, we have the axiomatic promise of ultimate justification and glorification. The next question, B, is called out from what? The question called out from what carries the hidden yet obvious reality of separation. Separation or being called out requires two categories or classes, one to be called out from and another to be called out to. If there is only one category or class, then separation or being called out is impossible by definition. The question is to identify what the two categories or classes are. The answer is given by Jesus himself in the parable of the sheep and goats as part of the Olivet Discourse found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. In this parable, Jesus reveals his part as the shepherd, i.e. the leader and protector of his own, the sheep, taking his eventual role as the judge of the living and the dead at the conclusion of the Great Tribulation. During this event, Jesus separates one group referred to as his sheep onto his right hand and separates another group referred to as the goats onto his left hand. The sheep are blessed by God, enter into their eternal reward and inheritance in heaven, while the goats are cursed and enter in by their choice of their rebellion into eternal punishment in the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now as we survey all of scripture, it is possible to synonymously identify the sheep as those who have submitted to God's call to repentance from rebellion, to receive God's gift of unmerited grace through faith, and now follow Jesus as their good shepherd. The goats are identified as those who remain in rebellion against God and his call of repentance and his offer of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Initially, as a result of the fall, all men began and remain in the category of being a goat until such time as that by God's grace they respond to his call to repentance and receive the gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. When we do so, we receive his spirit and become a new creation. We are now his sheep, called by his name, sealed by his spirit, and destined to his gift of eternal life as a sheep. The difference between one standing as a sheep or a goat is a distinction dictated by our response to his call. If our response to his call is to repent of our rebellion and to submit ourselves to his righteousness instead of our own, then we are separated out from our former status and destiny as a goat, and we are now justified in Christ, where we are covered by his righteousness, where we become sons and daughters by adoption. As his sons and daughters, i.e. his sheep, church, the outcalled ones, we now receive the inheritance of eternal life. Finally, we have the last question, C, called out to do what? The final question derived from the definition forms the basis for question number three above, namely, what are the biblical responsibilities of the church? Since these two are synonymous, we will wait to address the answer in its proper order. In conclusion to answering question one, what is the biblical definition of the word church, we learn that the church, as defined by the Bible, is a group known ultimately only by the heart to God, who by his grace he has called from being goats and have now been separated from sin, rebellion, death, eternal suffering, and the world by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. This group is now redeemed, justified, sanctified as followers of Jesus Christ the Good Shepherd. As his followers, his sheep, 
We are sealed and set apart to receive eternal life as a free gift. The next question on our list is number two. How does God define his own church? You will recall that in contrast to the proper perspective, the worldly question was, quote, how does man define his own church, unquote. In answering this question, we can look throughout history up until the present to see the various resultant outcomes of man defining the church. If we were to attempt to articulate every possible definition, we would doubtlessly require several episodes just to be complete. But in general, the central aspect of men's effort to define the church is a result of man's basic conscious or unconscious attempts to conform God and his church to the needs and desires of man's heart rather than for man to submit himself and his desires to God's will. In defining the church, traditionally the church has been seen in two ways. One, the visible church. The visible church is defined as being comprised of all those who attend services, who claim to be Christians, etc. Two, the invisible church. The invisible church is defined as being comprised only of those who are actually, quote, born again, unquote. Unfortunately, the terms visible and or invisible for me tend to be somewhat problematic in that they can be misleading and one-dimensional. For example, the term visible would seem to limit the discussion to those elements of the church which are by necessity material and can only be detected by one or more of the human senses. The term invisible would conversely limit the discussion to those elements of the church which cannot be detected by one or more of the senses. Additionally, some of the terms within the definition seem to carry logical fallacies when placed into context with the whole. For example, the idea in the definition of the visible church that simply claiming to be a quote-unquote Christian equates to in fact being a Christian falls flat. Or again, the idea that calling oneself a Christian means in fact that one has been called out and separated and is thus part of Christ's body, the church, assumes facts not in evidence. While the definition of the invisible church is far better stated than that of the visible, it is still theologically incorrect since it is clear that if one is truly born again or born from above that this condition will also carry the reality that the believer in question will be a new creation filled by the Spirit of God by his promise. Consequently, the Spirit will bear fruit of various kinds according to his grace which are visible to all. Rather than the traditional terms of visible and or invisible, the following terms may be more illustrative as options for describing the church. Option A, corporate organization. Option B, house of faith. Let us discuss the above options and their definitions as they apply to understanding the church. First is option A, the corporate organization. In this sense, the term church is ultimately defined as a corporate organization which is visible, comprising a physical edifice with brick and mortar to contain its members. The church must also include a titular head such as the pope, or a denominational council, a bishop, a pastor, a rabbi, etc. Within this definition, most insist that the church as such must also include a hierarchical structure with bishops, elders, priests, cardinals, deacons, etc. Moving on, the church must have its congregation, the laity, with its individual members who support and submit largely, if not exclusively, to the authority of the hierarchy. And lastly, the church must have certain ceremonies, rituals, and rites that are theoretically ordered by the Bible, tradition, and or decree by the hierarchy which ostensibly ratify the church. In contrast to option A, we have option B, household of faith. Under this definition, the unincorporated church does not look to the elements of option A to initiate, define, or grade itself as being complete, authentic, or healthy. At the same time, finding corporate elements inside the unincorporated church does not automatically disqualify the church from being authentic. 
In option B, the church may incorporate aspects of the option A church, but this is simply as a logical and natural expression of the members of the body who have grown by God's grace to the extent that it becomes convenient to incorporate itself and adopt elements of the corporate structure so as to more easily and efficiently serve the body as well as Christ himself. In the final analysis, the option B church is that group of believers who remain faithful to the cornerstone and foundation of the church defined according to Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 where it says quote, for where two